body. And we'll talk about the impact on nutrition, hormonal imbalance, uh, inflammatory diseases, and even mood disorders. And then we'll talk some about uh, functional testing and um, treatment programs to treat it. So uh, the first slide I want to start with is um, a slide on metabolism and the gut. And our digestive system is basically a gateway for our entire metabolism. <clears throat> so we take in foods through the mouth and uh, we excrete through our colon. And this is basically the way that our entire hormonal system and immune system uh, communicates and functions. Uh, so basically, uh, the toxins in our body need to be excreted through the digestive system and nutrients put in. And there's a, a, a famous naturopathic um, saying that death begins in the colon. And when in doubt, treat the gut, because the digestive system plays such an integral role in our health. So we're, each of us is basically our health depends on our genes and our environment. And um, we have... Uh, our diet and our lifestyle have a big uh, role uh, that play a big role in this. Um, and th the microbiota of our gut uh, is uh, unique in each of us. And um, in the future, as we go towards more personalized health care, we should uh, pay close attention to this as this plays a really important in our uh, health. Our uh, gastrointestinal system essentially is central uh, to the health of our body. Any imbalance in our uh, gastrointestinal system profoundly affects our health. And we'll go on to talk about our digestion, how we absorb food. We'll talk about intestinal permeability and how that affects um, uh, systemic disease and the intestinal flora of our gut, which is so important in our health and um, how all of this can affect inflammation and um, autoimmunity and immune regulation. So uh, the beneficial bacteria in our intestine, uh, we all may have heard a lot about probiotics and uh, how important they are for health. Uh, we have about 100 trillion bacteria in our intestines, and these comprise about 70% of our immune system. Uh, and they account for about half the volume of the contents in our colon. And we begin to colonize these at the time of birth. And even the way we're born, whether we're uh, born vaginally or C-section, uh, breastfeeding, and the time of all of this has a lot to do with the health of our uh, uh, gastrointestinal system and the growth of these bacteria and uh, the health of our immune system. These beneficial bacteria play an integral role in our digestion. They help us uh, synthesize vitamins. They uh, help us uh, excrete hormones uh, uh, through our liver, um, and that plays a role in detoxification and cancer. Uh, they help us uh, not be colonized by uh, bad bacteria and yeast, and they help protect the cells of our colon, and that plays a role in um, preventing colon cancer. So our gut microflora can be um, affected by many things. We talked about the, uh, uh, the way we're born, so C-section or vaginal delivery, our genes, uh, the environment where we're in as children, um, age, diet, poor diet can affect them negatively, uh, good diets can affect them positively, and drugs like antibiotics uh, are uh, basically deadly to the intestinal flora, and probiotics, uh, good probiotics can help. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. Um, the, our flora play a big role in our immunity. This starts, again, at the time of birth, and um, again, if these are affected negatively, this can uh, negatively impact our immune system uh, uh, throughout life. Uh, so. They have such an integral role in everything, uh, including uh, body weight and obesity. This study shows that the microflora of obese individuals is different than that of lean individuals. And so we really want to look at um, uh, the, the flora of the gut, even when we're thinking about uh, patients with obesity, body weight, and even the obesity epidemic. So we talked a little bit about this already. Uh, the microflora of our gut, they have an integral role in production of vitamins, um, vitamin K. Uh, they help us absorb uh, nutrients. Um, they help 
protect us from um, bad pathogens. Uh, when they're lower in numbers, we tend to get overgrowth of yeast and bad bacteria, and um, they help the health of our intestinal cells and protect against colon cancer and um, basically a neoplastic formation. So uh, we've all heard about probiotics. Um, uh, unfortunately, probiotics aren't FDA regulated, so quality control is poor. And we see a lot of probiotics out there, but when you test them, 80% of preparations, 1% uh, uh, or less have the bacterial concentrations that, are, that you see on the label. So it's important to get a good probiotic that's really from a research-based um, uh, a nutraceutical company or one that's uh, formulated by a physician uh, because the probiotics need to be um, alive at the time you uh, take them in. They're not always alive. They have to have shelf viability. Uh, they have to withstand stomach acidity and um, they actually have to get down to the colon and adhere to the walls. So sometimes it's not just as simple as just taking a probiotic. Uh, it really, the strains and the types and the lability of the uh, probiotic is very important. Uh, so the, another factor that goes into the health of our gut is actually the health of the cells of our gut. And so we'll go on to talk about this later in, uh, when we talk about leaky gut. But it's important that the, the small cells of our gut stay tight and that the villi in the intestine um, are healthy so that we can absorb nutrients. And this can be uh, negatively affected uh, by things like food allergies uh, and uh, medications and antibiotics and overgrowth of bad bacteria and yeast. Um, another factor that goes on into the health of our gut is how we uh, digest our food and digestive enzymes. Um, digestion, uh, in, it actually starts before you even start eating. Uh, when you see the food, um, your brain sends a signal to your intestine, and then you need to secrete the right amount of digestive enzymes to break down and assimilate the food. So uh, there's you know, a whole group of digestive enzymes like uh, stomach acid, pancreatic enzymes, and um, it's important to think of these when we take antacids because antacids actually decrease our digestion. So some of the things that can cause dysfunction in our digestive system are of diet, diet low in fiber, high in glycemic load and poor nutri uh, nutrient density. Infections can hurt the intestinal lining, uh, imbalances in the uh, gut microflora. Food allergies can hurt our intestinal lining. Medications <clears throat> like uh, antibiotics, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents like Advil and um, birth control pills uh, can affect our gut negatively. Stress can do this, genetics and toxins. One second. Oh, moving down. Hey, Dr. Rochelle, did we lose? Yeah, we lost the, okay, I think it's back. Here we go. All right. So now we'll go on to talk about what are some of the things that damage our intestinal system. And dysbiosis, and some of you may have heard about this, is one of the problems we run into when the amounts of beneficial bacteria are not there. And that happens uh, from birth, uh, from pro uh, not having enough friendly bacteria, from antibiotics. And um, when this happens, you get overgrowth of bad bacteria and yeast in the intestine. And this can happen in any of our mucosal surfaces. We see it more in the digestive system, but it can really happen um, anywhere, like in our lungs, nose, sinuses, um, nails. Uh, some of the things that can cause this, again, are broad-spectrum antibiotics, not digesting our food right. And when we take uh, medications like uh, antacids, uh, that can decrease our digestion further. Chronic constipation, stress can do this. Um, and even emotions, fear and anger, can um, increase growth of some of the bad bacteria and cause more dysbiosis. You can get overgrowth of many different types of bacteria, yeast and fungi. A good way to test this is functional stool testing, and that'll give you um, more information than the traditional tests done 
that just look for basic um, testing, this goes into a little bit more detail with functional stool testing, and we'll talk about that in the second part of the webinar. So candida um, is another big one that can overgrow when you don't have enough uh, beneficial bacteria. And we all have yeast in small amounts of our intestines, but um, uh, let's go back over here. But when we get overgrowth of yeast, that's when we can run into a lot of problems, uh, uh, feel a lot of the symptoms of yeast overgrowth, like fatigue, insomnia, anxiety, mood swings. It can affect our immune system uh, negatively. Um, so here's a joke. Uh, the doctor says, relax, it's just a yeast infection. But sometimes yeast can um, actually play a big role in our health. Parasites are another uh, problem that can overgrow. Um, this, again, can be um, tested with functional stool testing. Uh, you don't always have symptoms when you have parasites. So uh, you know, uh, it's good to do the stool testing if we suspect this. But if uh, there are symptoms, they include things like diarrhea, constipation, fatigue, burping, uh, bloating, things like that. So, um, Another problem that can arise in the gut is something called leaky gut. And we talked about what a healthy uh, intestinal lining looks like, where the cells are kind of tightly bound together. Uh, but the cells can get leaky. And when the cells get leaky, food particles can leak into the blood. Uh, and then you can get food allergies. And this is called leaky gut. And some of the things that cause this are, again, poor diet. Stress can cause this. Uh, low stomach acid can cause this, um, <clears throat> uh, 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 antibiotics and uh, medications can cause this. And when this uh, barrier gets leaky, you get food allergies, uh, you don't absorb your food right, so you can get malnutrition and decrease in uh, vitamins and minerals like um, B12, zinc, and things like that. You can get more overgrowth of bad bacteria and yeast. And this puts a toxic burden on the body. And it's this toxic burden that can play a role in creating a systemic disease. Also, the food particles that leak um, through, the, uh, through these um, uh, leaky barrier can basically go and attack other distant organs. So leaky gut uh, plays a role in other autoimmune diseases and other systemic diseases as well. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So again, stomach acid plays a really important role in this. Um, it, if you don't have enough stomach acid, one, you don't digest your food right, you don't absorb your nutrients, and this can add to food allergies, and food allergies can add to systemic diseases. So um, there are two types of food allergies, and some of you may have wanted to have some testing done. And traditional doctors usually look for the immediate type of food allergy, and that's the IgE type of allergy. That's the al type of allergy you get uh, when you eat a food and you can get some uh, swelling or difficulty breathing. But uh, there's another type of food allergy called an IgG type of allergy, and that's a more delayed um, allergic response. Uh, so causes of the delayed allergy response can be monotonous diets, genetics, uh, grains, of the leaky gut like we talked about uh, that causes an enhanced intestinal permeability and overgrowth of bacteria. So the top nine foods we eat are uh, listed here, processed foods, white bread, breads, col uh, cola, sugar, and all of these um, uh, add to uh, you know, decreasing the health of our intestines and show up as food allergies often. And um, what's interesting is food allergies and the signs and symptoms really involve a lot of the systems of the body. Uh, signs and symptoms of food allergy can include depression, brain fog, headaches. Um, a lot of people have sinus congestion, and that, that's chronic, chronic sinusitis, um, ear and throat infections, any kind of rash. Any kind of skin infection really can be uh, related to uh, food allergies. Unexplained fatigue, joint pain, uh, even things like interstitial cystitis, um, and of course bigger things like autoimmune diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, and irritable bowel disease uh, uh, are related to food allergies. 
A big problem foods, again, are gluten, dairy, eggs, yeast, uh, corn, and soy. And we see these often pop up when we uh, test for IgG-type food allergies. And when you relieve them and remove them from the diet, a lot of the symptoms uh, get better. Dairy and gluten, again, uh, they're co uh, common offenders. And we see them in IgG food allergy testing. A lot of the problems, again, with gluten uh, and that can be related to gluten are some of the problems listed here, type 1 diabetes, thyroid problems, obesity, depression. Uh, these can all be related. More on the problems that can be related to food allergies and leaky gut, really. So anytime we see these problems uh, and someone suffers from these problems, uh, it warrants to take a look uh, into the health of the digestive tract. So another uh, a problem that you, we can see that can damage the gut is poor digestion. And traditionally, when we have a symptom with our digestion or reflux, uh, uh, a lot of patients are, tend to be given anti-digestive medications, such as uh, antacids. The problem, uh, a lot of the times, is a lack of uh, stomach acid and a lack of digestive enzymes. Um, and so uh, what can go wrong with this is uh, you can get things like reflux from um, acid blockers and disorders in motility. And all of these can cause more uh, intestinal permeability, more dysbiosis, and more uh, dysfunction in the digestive tract. So we should really pay uh, attention to how we are digesting our food because that in and of itself uh, further hurts the health of the digestive tract. And if there's a problem, uh, it's better to treat with digestive enzymes uh, rather than block digestion by using antacids. So again, causes of digestive insufficiencies can be um, uh, the first word, which really means low stomach acid, uh, uh, overgrowth of bad bacteria, and um, overeating can do this. So uh, with consideration to uh, all the topic of food allergies and leaky gut and things like this, it's really important to pay attention to what's in our food. A lot of times our food contains antibiotics, it contains hormones, it contains hidden additives and um, preservatives that are actually adding to our food allergies and adding to some of these problems. So uh, attention to these really helps. And it's um, again important to say that food reactions can involve many organ systems. So uh, when you have any of these symptoms, it's important to uh, pay attention to the digestive tract. You can have itching, swelling, nausea, heartburn, um, hives, uh, even asthma, bronchitis, all of these can be related. And even uh, you know, the immune complexes that are formed through leaky gut can damage distant organs such as the kidneys and um, joints. And you see this in rheumatoid arthritis, in immune kidney disease, and um, things like that. So now we'll talk about some of the signs and symptoms of uh, things that can go on with our digestive tract. And if you're getting recurrent gastrointestinal infections, a chronic diarrhea, uh, alternating between diarrhea and constipation can be a symptom. Uh, symptoms of irritable bowel, like uh, stomach cramps or bloating. Um, of course, mucus or blood in the stool. Chronic constipation, um, gas or bloating, or any type of abdominal discomfort. Uh, all of these can be symptoms, uh, even mood swings, uh, cognitive dysfunction, and we'll talk about how that's related in the second part of the webinar. Low energy, fatigue, depression, anxiety, sinus congestion, itching, and bad breath. All of these um, are clues that our digestive system is not working right and um, should be evaluated. Uh, I think that's the first part of our webinar, so maybe we can open it up for any questions. Dr. Rochelle? Yes. Okay, yes, we do have some questions for you. Okay. Um, one, the first question was, was wondering if drinking alkaline water um, affects the proper acid balance in the stomach. 
So alkaline water um, can, can definitely um, help, uh, but it's not directly related to, um, if the question is with regards to um, the digestion and producing um, appropriate acid in the stomach, um, I can't say that it can directly do that. More appropriate for that would be taking digestive enzymes and um, actually betaine and HCL that can help. And as the problem gets healed, you can actually start to secrete your own digestive enzymes. So, uh, Alkaline water is good, but more for digestion, I would go ahead and target it with using digestive enzymes. Okay, great. And we got another great question. Um, in your opinion, how, what do you feel about colonics? Is this a procedure that is recommended for having a healthy colon? Okay, and that's a good one. Um, I personally don't think so. I don't think we were meant to have colonics. I think they can uh, disrupt the uh, microbiota of our intestines. It's better to um, treat the problem from its root. That means if there's a problem with constipation, looking at uh, some of the things that can cause it, for example, hormonal imbalance, thyroid imbalance, um, looking at things like candida, and really getting the bowels to move naturally would be a better way. Maybe even putting in probiotics, but I personally don't recommend uh, colonics. Okay. And we have another question for a mother who would like to know, how can she help her infants, the infants and toddlers with gut health? That's a great question, and that's a, the most important time to start. So uh, one of the most important things is to try to use uh, antibiotics when necessary and not to, to you know, watch for the abuse of antibiotics. Um, another thing is to, you can use probiotics safely in children. Probiotics can be um, given to kind of maintain that gut flora and, you know, not... Uh, starting children off on a lot of the sugary foods and starches and things that can start to, um, you know, uh, basically hurt the digestive system. So really all the things that are in adults can be done in children, and it's actually the appropriate time to start doing it. Thank you for that. And let's see, we have a, another question from a, from a listener who's been tested positive for candida through blood work but upon doing a stool analysis, no candida was present. Does that mean she absolutely has no candida in the gut? Could she have overgrowth somewhere else in the body? Well, we should um, know, you know, what stool test was used, and, um, you know, that's important, and we're all um, three antibodies, were they elevated or not. But yes, you can have candida other places in the body. And um, if clinically and with symptoms you have candida, I would still uh, go ahead and treat the candida. So some of the symptoms that we talked about, bloating, sugar, we didn't talk about sugar cravings, but sugar cravings is one of them, uh, constipation. Um, if these things are present and if all three antibodies are high that's, uh, in the blood, that's acute current infection. And if they didn't grow out in the stool, but you still have gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, I would go ahead and treat them uh, in the stool as well, but surely they can be in other mucous membranes also. Okay. Ian, we've got lots of questions today for you. This is great. We have a young lady who's been suffering from leaky gut and candida for two years. She's taking out glutamine, digestive enzymes, pepsin, and probiotics along with other natural stomach strengthening supplements and she hasn't eaten any dairy or gluten or sugar for a year and a half but is still suffering. Is there any other recommendations that you could make? From the Giga. And she's had the um, uh, appropriate, you know, it's important to do the appropriate stool testing and make sure we're not missing any uh, bacteria that are maybe resistant if you've used some botanicals. Uh, you know, sometimes we do have to use um, antibiotics to actually kill some of the bad bacteria there. They're not always sensitive to the botanicals and the stool testing gives us this information. Um, I would also look into food allergies. Sometimes when leaky gut is severe, you become allergic to all the foods you're eating. So it's kind of like you have to keep um, 
chasing that, but if one of the things we're eating part of a healthy diet is an allergen, that can be further hurting the intestines. Stress levels are very important. Stress can further um, cause imbalance in the gut and further cause leaky gut. So, um, you know, we can look into all of these things. Uh, I don't know if she's taking N-butyrate. Uh, some of these things can help. Okay, great. Does that answer? And we have a, another question. And we have a, a person who had a, a severe reaction from eating a sweet potato and since then has been diagnosed with chronic fatigue. Have you heard of such severe or violent reactions from foods like this before? A turn chronic? Uh, well, she could have. Uh, that sounds like an immediate, uh, like it, the type of IgE uh, allergic reaction. Uh, you know, if she got any uh, difficulty breathing or depends what the reaction was. But um, I don't know if, you know, eating necessarily the sweet potato caused chronic fatigue, but there could be things in the middle there that we need to look at that are related to why she got that allergy that can be related to the chronic fatigue. I know that's not a clear answer, but um, so basically they could be related, but perhaps not directly in that the sweet potato didn't directly cause the chronic fatigue, but there could be things at play there in the middle that are related to both of them. So it warrants to look deeper, you know, to do testing, uh, all the testing we're going to talk about, and do, uh, you know, a good integrative workup uh, to see what's going on. Great. And we have a very good question from a listener to, who would like to know what type of doctor is preferred to do the proper testing for all this. Would you recommend a general practitioner, an allergist, or some other type of doctor? So. Um, Gastroenterologists are good in that we can do, uh, you know, certain uh, big tests that give us information about what's actually there. So, God forbid, is there like col is there colon cancer or is there bleeding in the intestine? So, those tests are always good to do for end line information. But if you want to get to the a kind of nitty gritty and bottom of what's going on, functional testing would be good. And we'll talk about this in the second part. And really, functional medicine doctors, uh, contemporary medicine doctors, integrative practitioners, um, all you know, all of uh, this type of field. Uh, are specialists in looking at some of these things. So I would say an integrative a practitioner can kind of look at all of this together and do this specialized kind of stool testing. Great. And we have a question from, another question from a listener, and that has a lot of food allergies and had 77 food allergies and is now down to about 50 in two years, and it's greatly affecting her life. And per Metametrics testing, she's still at a level two for yeast. She's been on fluconazole. Do you have any other recommendations for supplements that she might want to take? She's been on, um, you know, so again, with this, I would um, talk about diet a lot. Uh, diet has a, a, a big uh, part of it. Um, and I use the paleo diet a lot. But for supplements, she can take things like Tandinex, bring in botanicals that have um, uh, really like ginger and all the components in Candinex that can aid with the fluconazole and even bring in the statin. Because sometimes when you take these things over long periods of time, the yeast in the intestine can become resistant to them. And that's, again, another place where the functional stool testing is important because it can give us the, the readout of uh, what's the, what type of yeast you have and if it's sensitive to what you're taking. And these sensitivities can change. So perhaps the yeast have now become resistant to the fluconazole. So um, I would do more testing and maybe use some botanicals, bring in the botanicals like Candinex there. And also you can try things like Nystatin. Great. And we have another person who heard that steel-cut oats was the best thing for cleaning the gut out naturally and ate it and then seemed like that that was absolutely cleaned her out and was wondering if she should have kept at it. Was it the was it really doing cleaning out, doing it uh, purpose of by cleaning out the bowl bowel or was she what, what did she eat I'm sorry I didn't hear that part steel cut steel cut oats oats 
Yeah, oh, it's oatmeal. It's called steel cut oatmeal. Have you heard of that? To, to clean out the gut. Mhm. Hmm. I haven't really. So she's asking if she should continue to take that. Mhm. Were the symptoms better? <laughs> no, it it gave her diarrhea real bad, and it's really yeah. Oatmeal. So I wouldn't really. You know, oat is something I would. Um, when we're trying to treat candida and some of these uh, digestive issues and intestinal uh, problems, I would really. I usually recommend not eating oat and eat, really not eating grains. Uh, one, because they can further uh, hurt intestinal lining, and two, because they're starchy, and when you're trying to kill candida, they're so resistant that you really want to stay away from anything that is starchy. So I would really stay away from oats during that period, especially, that you're trying to take care of some of these problems. Well, Dr. Rochelle, that's the questions that we have for today, and I want to thank Dr. Rochelle, who is a part of Holtorf Medical Group. Dr. Rochelle is board-certified family physician and a diplomat of the Anti-Aging Academy uh, with the board certification in anti-aging and regenerative medicine. If you would like to join us again, we will be continuing this uh, webinar in two weeks, and that will be on July the um, 12th at 12 p.m. This webinar will be available on our website at holtorfmed.com so that you can listen to the first uh, section again if you would like to share with your friends. And again, I want to thank Dr. Rochelle Tazib of Holtorf Medical Group for the great information today. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rochelle. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And again, we'll, we will see you back here in two weeks. Have a great day.